Practical of Dr. Wendy Williams, Assistant Professor of Media and Communications at the LSE. Thank you very much, Wendy. So she'll take it from here. So good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all had a good lunch, a slightly shortened lunch, but I hope you're ready for this uh, uh, session on social media and uh, creating a space for agency. So, um, I'm very pleased to, to be chairing this, channel, this panel and I'm uh, very grateful to Naufiku and to Milou for inviting me to do so. I think we've got a really interesting uh, panel uh, lined up for today, all um, uh, around the theme for this afternoon. So we're obviously told in recent years that social media have played an increasingly influential role in provoking protests and resistance around the world. Uh, Lots of debates around the Arab Spring, of course, a couple of years ago. Um, but in the rest of the continent, in sub-Saharan Africa, we've seen digital media in the form of blogging, tweeting, Facebook, YouTube, Vine, Instagram, also increasingly providing an avenue for youth across different parts of Africa to engage with contemporary issues and become politically and socially conscious. We still don't have reliable statistics, but um, rough estimates seem to suggest that currently almost 125 million Africans have access to Facebook, which is roughly equal to about 11% of Africa's population. But of course, as we know, digital divides across class, gender, race, between urban and rural areas continue to persist. And there are also growing concerns about government surveillance of social media as well as a growing uh, power of corporate social platforms such as uh, uh, Facebook and Twitter uh, in different parts of the global south. And some of you might have followed uh, recent events in India around contestations around uh, Facebook there. These corporations are also uh, um, sort of engaged in efforts to extract personal data from internet users. So this is the, the slight uh, critical connotations uh, in this debate. But of course, on the other hand, we do have a situation where there are still limitations on freedom of expression in many African countries, and particularly limitations in physical spaces, in squares, public areas, uh, uh, challenges around uh, demonstrations, the ability to, to host protests, etc., that do not exist in all countries. So social media could be said to have created the opportunity for young people to voice their opinions. They've arguably empowered Africans to challenge stereotypes and change global narratives, as we saw, for example, in the Someone uh, must, tell, must Tell CNN hashtag in Kenya, and also recently in the Roads Must Fall uh, hashtag in South Africa. So in line with the conference theme of challenging conventions, um, this panel aims to provoke a discussion on the credibility and value of social media as a means of creating the agency necessary to drive cultural, economic, and political reform. So I'm now pleased to introduce our four panel members uh, for today. So first up, we have Tomi Ola Depo, who's a PhD graduate um, at the Center for Cultural Policy Studies at the University of Warwick, and currently an independent digital media researcher. And she will be presenting a paper on creative digital resistance in the Nigerian public sphere, specifically focusing on the case of Budge IT. Is that how I pronounce it? Okay. Budget, okay. Um, and second up, we then have Monica Mark, who we were very privileged to have, and who is coincidentally um, in lo visiting London this week, but who is normally based in Dakar in Senegal, and is the West Africa correspondent for the internet media company BuzzFeed, and formerly also with The Guardian. Our third panelist is uh, Panashe Shigumatsi, who is joining us from Johannesburg, and who is the founder and editor of Vanguard Magazine, which is a digital platform for young black women in South Africa. And she's also a columnist at Forbes Africa and reporter and project executive, uh, uh, executive sorry, at CNBC Africa. And on top of that, she's also a novelist, and she's hoping to publish her novel, Sweet Medicine, later this year, if I understand it. And then last, but not least, we have Yafet Omoyjua, who is a, a very active blogger, formerly a lecturer at the Free <coughs> University in Germany, uh, also a columnist at Punch newspapers in, uh, in Nigeria, a consultant at the Heinrich Böll Foundation, and a curator at omoyjua.com, and very active on Twitter as well. Um, so these are our panelists for today. Um, uh, we'll kick off with Tomi, who will present for about 10 minutes, and then the remaining three panel members will present for about five minutes, and then after that we'll have a, a second 
round of five minutes where they will be responding to each other's presentations. And then we hope to have around 20, 30 minutes left for uh, questions from the audience. So please, the um, floor is over to Tommy for now. Thank you. Thank you for having me, organizers of this summit. My name is Tomi Oladipo, and I'm a PhD graduate of the University of Warwick. Um, I did my PhD on digital media and the culture of democracy in Nigeria. Budget was one of my case studies during my research, and with budget, I found that they created a new model for activism and resistance in the polity. So where you have hashtags and you have um, protest matches, which are useful for you know, engaging change, um, there's still need for these changes to be sustainable. And with budget, I found that their framework was quite useful in this regard. But before we go on to the case study, um, I'd like, take, take, like to take you through um, a background of this presentation. So um, it is no news that in Africa, the adoption of digital technologies, digital media technologies is rising. And these uses vary from businesses, e-commerce rising, to entertainment, to small-scale businesses and creative industries booming. As a matter of fact, I was part of a research study just last month, and I got to go to Nigeria to speak to um, entrepreneurs, creative, you know, creative um, people. And when I asked them how have they gotten their skills, because I was looking at skills gap, I found out that many of them had actually gotten their skills online not from being you know, formally taught in universities and institutions, but by going on YouTube, they have been able to create a business platform for themselves. And Instagram is their, you know, is their window, is their shopping place where they can say, contact me on WhatsApp, this is what I have to sell. So there are all these uses you know, arising in Africa, and it is awesome to see this happen. But on the political front, <coughs> digital media also has the potential to support citizens, um, citizens who are active on the internet, whom I call netizens, um, in holding their respective governments accountable. And we've seen a lot of this with various hashtags on, on the internet. But still, there are challenges to this democratic ideal, and I'll bring us to these challenges later on in the presentation. The idea of digital media resistance and social change is not something that is um, exclusive to Africa. We've seen it all over the world. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite books is by Claire Shirky, Claire Shirky which is where he talks about um, there being a major power and culture shift because everyday citizens are able to band together and take a stand on a mass action, on what they want, on what they need from whoever it is, be it a government body, be it a corporate organization. They are able to actually demand that listen to us, give us your attention. And this is awesome for democracy. <coughs> However, I am asking that how effective is this change when we make them happen? When we, when we go on Twitter and when we, when we use these hashtags and we make all the noise, how effective are these call to actions? The changes that come about from this hashtag activism, how sustainable are they? Um, I've dropped some examples here, Occupy Nigeria, Bring Back Our Girls, Child Not Bright. They are all really great initiatives. But what I would like to challenge us in this room is to think about how can we get these changes to be sustainable? How can we ensure that the voices that we raise online do not just start and stop with an issue until the next issue becomes the burning topic, even when the previous issue has not been fully resolved? That is the, you know, the question that I want to raise. Um, so I then come up with this idea of creative digital resistance. What do I mean by creative digital resistance? Creative digital resistance is the activism that is not necessarily boot on soil. It might support protest matches, but it is not limited to protest matches. It is not so not slacktivism or clicktivism. You know, the trendy way in which a hashtag is trending and we just want to stand with because we have to stand with, because it's morally right to stand with or it's trendy to stand with and I am cool if I stand with. Um, it is not that form of activism. It is the development of creative and culturally relevant avenues by individuals, groups, and social enterprises to engage everyday information technologies in entrenching a culture of democracy. 
By the culture of democracy, I'm simply referring to a freedom to express your opinions, a freedom to demand accountability from your government, a freedom to demand transparency from your government without any fear of repercussion. This is a kind of social change that is engineered through creative uses of this technology. In the case study for this, for, for this presentation, I use body to demonstrate what I mean by creative digital resistance. What is budget? Budget was a result of a hackathon that um, took place in Lagos in 2011 by um, an open lab and pre-incubation space um, known as CC Hub, co-creation hub. And basically it was about, let's get together, let's find ways to use technology to, to improve on governance. And budget came about as an idea of, you know, the Nigerian budget, when they release it, we just see all these mass figures, these macro figures. But the man on the street, the lady selling bananas, um, on Third Milan Bridge. She has no idea what these figures mean to her. So why don't we come together? Why don't we break down this budget in the kind of language that everyday Nigerians would understand? This is what is written on their website. Many Nigerians with little or no knowledge of accounting and public finance management are lost when they see, if they ever get the chance to, the budget of different arms of government. Most media releases of the Nigerian government only have the macro figures as the finer details that trickle down to the citizens, such as the neighborhood projects, the roadside projects, are not fully explained. The maze of millions and billions in the thick budget documents tend to confuse, and it is difficult to put into clear context on how public funds are actually spent. Now, how has budget been able to use creative and cultural devices to break down the budget for everyday citizens? That is one example, and I will come back to this slide. The ideal of budget is that every Nigerian citizen must have access to the budget, no matter what level on the literacy span you are. Every Nigerian citizen must understand what it really means to them in their respective localities. They must talk about the budget amongst one another, offline and online, and I repeat, offline. Every Nigerian citizen must raise fact-based questions, not the herd mentality we have online where if one person is asking this question, you don't even critique it, you know, you just flow. No, budget is saying, raise fact-based questions about gray areas, wherever they might arise. Make demands on government to be more transparent. Budget achieves each and every one of these goals through creatively engaging digital media technologies. What's in what is in budget's um, digital media toolbox? I have not been able to exhaust this list. But what I have found in the course of my research is they have a website, very simple to use, very interactive website. They have their Facebook page, they have Twitter, they have Instagram, YouTube, Storyfy, mobile apps. What are the creative communication techniques they use? First of all, they use infographics. One of the, one of the early infographics of Budgie that I found was one that said, um, it was about the presidential kitchen, actually. A certain amount of millions had been allocated to this presidential kitchen. And budget was like, this millions equals, and then they draw hospitals, how many hospitals, how many schools, how many. Just so when you pick it up, you don't have to have, you don't, you don't have, to have formal um, financial education training to understand that my president is eating three hospitals and two schools. <laughs> um, Budget has also used the technique of partnering, partnering with viral news and entertainment video channel. This particular one is known as Batterbox. Now, if you're familiar with Batterbox, Batterbox can ask the most mundane and interesting questions. They ask questions like, how many boyfriends do you think you should have? And you hear girls say like, I should have about five. One for my finances, one for my school fees. <laughs> And this is the same channel that Budget is not looking down on the way a news, a big media organization would have looked down on. Budget partners with this organization to then, you know what, go out and do a vox pop. How much do you get a driver's license in Nigeria? And after they did, and that's a form of research, it's a form of survey without being, it's a form of entertaining survey, you might say. And with this, I followed Budget on Twitter, and then I found that they actually challenged the FRSC, the Federal Road Safety Commission, Federal Road Safety Commission to say, why are Nigerians paying more than is advertised on your website for the license? Now, these are conversations that have not cropped up as a result of I stand with 
or and I'm not discounting the use of hashtags, but I'm just trying to challenge us to think even more broadly about the change that we can create in our society. <coughs> Budget has also used hashtags, actually. They've used Fix Our Oil. They've used Office of the Citizens, Open NAS. Um, and also, they have a tracking tool. Now, this tracking tool is very participatory in that when Budget says, we found out that the government is um, conducting a project um, in this area, if you live around there sending photos, sending reports, what are you seeing around you? It keeps the government on their toes. On the, should I say, downside, or neutral-ish side, but it is supported or partnered with, uh, partnered by um, international donor organizations. And I will come back to this idea. What has been the impact and the reach of budget? Budget has been able to reach over 750,000 Nigerians. Um, it has over 2,000 unique data requests monthly in that people actually now go to budget to request for information that they ordinarily would not even have paid attention to in the past. Now this brings me to the challenges. Budget model is really, really admirable. But still, it's internet based. And they do have offline, um, you know, offline um, platforms where they try to reach with publications and stuff, but it's still majorly on the internet. And in terms of internet access, how many Nigerians are on the internet? Because we are a very large population of over 170 million people, it's easy to see the numbers of people who are active on the internet as being such a large number. But when you look at it in proportion to the people who are offline, you know that a lot of people are still not gaining from this information the way they could. What can we do about it? I would suggest that mass media organizations need to be more proactive about what goes on on the internet. They shouldn't see the internet as um, a platform to simply share their links to their news stories and their web pages, but they should be more interactive. They should collaborate with enterprises like Budget and make sure that the entire polity is on the same page of what is going on. Let's take online, offline, and let's make it all work hand in hand. Another challenge is filter bubbles. The idea of filter bubbles is that when you search for something on the internet, there are algorithms that work behind the scene that make sure that you see what you would likely love to see, not what you would ordinarily not have on your time feed. So if I searched for an item on your computer and I searched for an item on your computer, I'll probably have different search results because they are based on your personal um, preferences. Now what does that mean for enterprises like Budget? If in the past you have always been searching for Kim Kardashian, you are not likely to stumble on budget in your search feed, even if you type the budget. You'll probably be seeing how much Kim Kardashian has made last year. <laughs> that is just the reality. And these are things that we need to address. And I think as an individual, this is something I wrote in an article a couple of days ago, we need to be more active in searching for stuff and not wait for stuff to be delivered to us. The reliance on donor funding we like to think that donor bodies are neutral, and it would have been the ideal situation. But donor funding is not always going to be there. And donors are not given out of the goodness of their heart, no matter how lovely that would be. There needs to be a way to find how enterprises like Budget can be sponsored and funded outside of relying on international bodies, or relying on any other you know, form of, form of um, funding that will hamper on the credibility that they already have. And for me, sitting down here, I think citizen-sponsored funding would have been ideal. But then that would take us into another long debate. I call for a coordination of communication efforts um, amongst traditional and digital media channels in Nigeria and ask that journalism spread its tentacles into big data because that is the future in Nigeria. Thank you very much. To, uh, uh, to Monica, would you like to jump in here? Or um, Hello, Is, um, am I speaking loud enough? Yeah. Um, I'm going to start off by sharing a story that I covered uh, back when I was with The Guardian. 
which I think illustrates quite nicely where we are with social media in West Africa. Um, it was back in 2012, and uh, it was ahead of elections in Senegal. And the president, who'd served two terms, WAD, wanted to sort of tinker with the constitution so that he could run for a third term. And Senegalese, so they've had an established democracy for a while, so they weren't, you know, they were having none of this. Um, so a group of uh, guys, one evening, this, this all coincided with like inflation, fuel prices going up, um, power cuts, all these things that are sort of problems across the region, but, and this came at the same time as the president trying to extend his, his term in power. So one evening, a group of young men had spent 24 hours just sat in the darkness in their flat in Dakar, and they were fed up with it. So they went on Facebook the next day, and um, they basically posted a message that, you know, nous en avons marre de ça, which means we've had enough of this, we're fed up with this. And within a few days, this post became this actual movement, which was called Yon Amar, so we're fed up, and it became this big movement that actually brought thousands and thousands of Senegalese people out onto the streets, to the point that they were able to stop WAD from changing the constitution. So, you know, that's a, it's an example of how social media really can have an impact. It can, because it was driven primarily by um, online. I mean, it was people going onto the streets, so it translated into action. But that was how it started off. But when I spoke to one of the founders of this movement, um, Fadel Barry, he said the problem with this, even though it's been so important, is that every time there's a power cut, which is what had prompted him to, to start the movement, I can't reach people on their phones. I can't get, people aren't, can't go online. So I thought, you know, that kind of is a really nice illustration of how the limitations of what social media can achieve, but also the limitations of it in West Africa, the infrastructural problems that um, mean that social media isn't, it, it, it isn't quite, it doesn't have the numbers it has here, basically. Um, so, so that's where we are with social media. Now, how does that trans, how does that, what does that mean for organizations like BuzzFeed who are built primarily on social media um, in, within West Africa? Um, there is this sort of perception within journalism that where are we going, that social media is sort of eating up what you would call traditional serious journalism and that the two can't really coexist because people just want you know, tweets, they want to write um, like short snappy messages. I'm going to apply this to Nigeria, because um, that's, that's where I'm from and that's where I know most about. In Nigeria, the Bring Back Our Girls movement, which I assume everyone's heard about, was, a, again, primarily driven by social media. Um, it was millions of young Nigerians tweeting about this, and, and to be honest, the government initially tried to just brush it under the carpet and pretend it hadn't happened, which is insane anyway, but... Um, because it was kept alive on social media, they had, to, they had to do something about it. And that was great. And there were people coming out onto the streets as a result of this, and that was also great. But the problem was that message, you can't, Twitter doesn't allow you to have nuanced messages. Social media, it, it really instinctively goes against having a deep sort of detailed look at what's going on. So, with the, bring, so the whole Bring Back Our Girls movement was reduced to this, this slogan, we need to bring the girls back. And in fact, this, girls have been, been kidnapped for years, and it wasn't, there were reasons why the government couldn't do what they should have done, um, and they needed to have done more, but all of this couldn't be explained in a tweet, basically. Um, <laughs> so, again, that sort of shows in Nigeria the limit, how well social media can work, but also the, the problems with using, just relying on social media. Um, and going back to the infrastructure problem, uh, that this guy in Senegal had talked about. In Nigeria, there's pro there, were, there were millions of Nigerians tweeting this hashtag. But, you know, as Tommy was saying, it's a numbers game in Nigeria. Even if you had 10 million Nigerians tweeting about it, that's still the equivalent of maybe the front two rows, if Nigeria were, this room were Nigeria, front two rows of you tweeting about it. 10 million people is a lot, but it's not really a lot in Nigeria. So there's, again, it creates that bubble. And the way people have responded the way people who know about the context in places like Nigeria, in West Africa, so they've come up with solutions that actually fit. You can't just take what works in the West and bring it to 
somewhere that doesn't have the infrastructure. So the majority of, like, probably the most widely used Nigerian um, social media app is, uh, is Togo, which, I mean, I can see from the way everyone's looking at me, probably none of you have heard of it, right? <laughs> It's, um, but the reason it's so popular is because you don't have to have a smartphone to use it. It actually works. It's just a text messaging, um, messaging app, I guess. So it kind of works on text messages, but it also works on um, smartphones, which sounds really obvious, but, but isn't. A lot of apps, you have to have the app, you have to be on a smartphone. So again, to come back to where do um, non-traditional media like BuzzFeed, what role can we play in this kind of, um, in this context? Or you can do serious journalism, you, you have serious journalism, people think of BuzzFeed as a sort of more entertainment kind of thing, and, and that appeals to a wider audience, first of all. Um, so <laughs> Which appeals to a wider audience, but also it taps into entertainment news. I mean, if you see a story on, there's a, the most bu BuzzFeed's most popular video at the moment, there's a group of guys who tied rubber bands around the watermelons to see how many they had to do before the watermelon exploded. If you see that, and then you see what is uh, Buhari doing to improve Nigeria's oil sector, you're probably gonna click on the watermelon video. <laughs> and that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, that's not surprising, and that's the way it has been for, for a long time, and I, I don't imagine that's gonna change. That's sort of human nature. But what does we also tries to do the kind of stories that I also try and do that reach a wider audience because people are more likely to talk about it offline and online. So it is, for example, you can do things like there's a very funny, um, you know, do stories on, there's a very funny Facebook website called uh, things, things African Parents Say. And anyone who's got an African parent is gonna relate to this. It's, it's, it's just, you know, we know what they're like. <laughs> And, um, and it's an entertaining story, it is an entertainment story, it's nothing serious, it's not about budgets, it's not about oil sector or whatever, monetary policy, but it's actually also quite an important political story in that it helps people online using Facebook to reclaim their identity as Africans, like we get to, it's more nuanced than an in-depth news story, um, and, but it's also just as important. Um, where am I going with this? Yeah, basically, you know, so I'm trying to say that it doesn't always have to be serious stories and to think that sort of BuzzFeed is dumbing down, it actually can reach a wider audience because you're more likely to share that story. Oh, did you see that funny video? And you're more likely to talk about it offline as well. So you actually do have a bigger reach off and online. Um, and it can still be important whilst being entertaining. So I'm not trying to say oh, there's a place for serious news stories. They do have to be done. But it's there's very often this sort of depressed um, atmosphere amongst journalists that we're just dumbing down news and it's all, it's all over and where's this going? But you know, that, that's, that's not the case. As, and BuzzFeed and new media website are doing really well for a reason. It's just a way of finding, uh, of sort of fitting the two in together. Like, yeah, I think that's... Uh, yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much um, for a very interesting presentation, uh, Monica. We're moving from Lagos to Johannesburg, where there's been a lot of action in the last year, also around yeah. Twitter, Roads Must Fall, which brings us back to the panel that we just had before this, and over to Panasha. Just, I just want to start by clarifying, I don't, I no longer work at, at Forbes Africa. All right. Great. So, um, but ba I'm based at, at the University of Advantasant in Johannesburg, so I speak to, to that context specifically, and I think it really ties in with the, with the theme of this uh, panel, which is about using social media uh, for the purpose of, of creating spaces of agency. Um, and as a young person who, one, has created a platform uh, because I thought it was important that we own our media, particularly as young black people in a very white-dominated South Africa, white-dominated media space, um, that's obviously a topic that's important to me, how we own the spaces that, that we use and engage. Um, as well as also being a fallist, so i.e. a person who subscribes to the Fees Must Fall, Roads Must Fall um, movement and being in very much involved in what's happened in South Africa. That's the, the angle that I want to speak to. And I want to speak to the, the limits of, of social media and I, I think my, my main point, if, if you to get anything out of from what I say, is that social media is really just an enabler, it's not a substitute 
for the work that needs to be done, um, whether it's creating structural change, whether it's creating constitutional change. I find that there's sometimes a very uncritical celebration of social media, um, you know, social media and the digital space as the great leveler, which it's not. Um, and I'll speak to that in, in two different spaces and how we can see that social media um, and the digital space is, is it's limited, yet it also enables us to, to do a lot of um, different things. So the first aspect I wanna speak to is starting with one, um, that social media and the digital space amplifies or maps a lot of the existing inequalities that we have anyway. So as you mentioned before, the fact that this row in front will probably represent most countries, and particularly in, on the continent, um, Twitter engagement, for example. Sometimes we will have the sense after having created a hashtag, we got a trending all night that, wow, the whole country was talking about whether it's hashtag Zuma must fall or whatever kind of hashtag it is. And really, it's a very small sector of, of the population that is thinking about the same things. And sometimes we then over project what the implications are uh, the conversations happening amongst a particular bubble um, and, and what that means for the country. I think every election in South Africa we find ourselves, or the middle class finds themselves very surprised at, oh, how did we vote in the ANC? How did we vote in Zuma again? Um, and that also reflects how our media is a very middle class media that doesn't necessarily speak to what the so-called ordinary South African um, is thinking about. So I think that's something that then plays out a lot in social media where we tend to over project um, the implications of what is being spoken about. Yes, it does um, get certain things done and it does highlight certain issues, but again, it's always important to know that it speaks to a very certain, a very specific sector and it's predominantly middle class, the kind of people who have internet penetration, the kind of people who have a smartphone, which then really takes out a lot of the population. Um, and in South Africa, the, the biggest social media platform that we had was actually Mixit. I don't know if anyone knows what Mixit is. Um, I think it's actually defunct. Um, but even speaking that, the fact that I can say I think it's defunct speaks to my disconnection as a middle class person from using um, um, something like, like Mixit. And if anybody's been following, if you're on your phone right now, you should search um, hashtag are you referenceless. There's been a lot of protest action happening in South Africa. And this week specifically, um, there was action by women of Rhodes University against rape culture on campus and they use social media, along with what they were doing on the ground to publish a list of rapists on the campus. And so one of the hashtags that was quite interesting because there's been a number of days of action since Sunday um, and it started off with, with a list that was published online and students then called each other on campus and they went to go and find these, these rapists and they got the vice chancellor involved and this has been trending in South Africa. And it then got to a point when, yes, it's been, it's been trending, but what the woman decided to do is to then embark on a nude protest. And what was quite interesting is one of the responses by, by an adult, if I want to call it that, um, she said, you know, in the days of a hashtag, why would you have to go to such, uh, such um, actions? Why don't you simply use a hashtag and you wouldn't have to be undressing yourselves? And, you know, I thought that was quite interesting because it means you fundamentally uh, misunderstand um, the ways in which protest action is happening on campus and the, the limits or, or how far social media can go. And what we're seeing with students is that it's, it's something that's used complementarily. So you use it as a way to create the consciousness, to bring awareness to certain issues, but that doesn't substitute the hard work that needs to happen on the ground. So for example, people would like to say things about um, the Arab Spring, for example, and say, well, you know, after that, what happens? Social media does not replace the hard work of building movements. Social media does not replace the hard work of actually creating parties, creating institutions. So that's a key part that we need to um, think about as we embrace the euphoria of social media and agency and the ability to, to speak back. And within that, we also see that this inequalities also map um, the different, or the inequalities ma are mapped against which hashtags are going to gain currency. So once again, within the student movement, what we saw was that when students from historically white institutions tweeted about matters, that's when traditional media would go and flock there and they would report on that. 
Whereas when issues were reported on historically black campuses in South Africa, not much would happen, even if there were cases that were much more serious. For example, when there's police coming onto campuses, shooting with live ammunition, um, there'll be a very different response from media when it's particular people tweeting about a particular subject versus when it is at historically um, white institutions. I know that the, by the experience, many of us on those campuses have had very, um, interesting uh, interactions with the police. Um, and those are the ways in which we use social media to let our peers know what is happening to us. So for example, the vice chancellor is tweeting that there's no police on campus. We can then take a video to say, well, I'm standing in front of a policeman right now. There's no live ammunition being used. I can take a picture of the bullet that's just been shot at me. Those are the kind of ways in which we use social media to primarily to, to communicate with our peers, whether it's raising funds for bail and all of those kinds of of things are quite an important to note. And then the second aspect that I'd, I'd like to, to speak to is also just the limits of speaking back. Um, I think one of the things we've really enjoyed on social media is, for example, the hashtag someone tells CNN, um, hashtag, you know, you can speak back to CNN, we got an apology from CNN, yay. You know, those are things that are very exciting for us to see for the first time or in, in many ways, I think this also maps the kind of things we saw in African literature where empire is speaking back to, to those who have defined our narratives. But within that, something is also very important is who owns the platforms because we'll ultimately always be in a position where we're just speaking back and being reactionary as opposed to then what are the work, uh, what's the work that we need to do to create our own platforms. That's, that's a big part of why I started my platform because I was tired of complaining about why it was that we were presented or represented in the ways that, that we weren't um, or we were in, in, in media. And so we see this a lot with things like black Twitter, for example, and we celebrate the success of things like that and the kinds of ways we can, we can speak back to narratives and, and challenge people for the way in which um, uh, they, they represent black people. But we need to think about who owns Twitter, for example. Um, we know that the ownership is not black in any way. Uh, we know that those who are hired by Twitter are not black as well. So, and the people who are driving a lot of the usage and the traffic are black people. And what are the ways in which that actually begins to matter? We start seeing things like Black Lives Matter where posts are being taken down because Facebook, certain Facebook employees think that that's not palatable, for example. They think that that's, that doesn't really suit their sensibilities. So we start seeing that there are limits to simply cottoning onto a platform. If we don't own that platform, they now have access to the information that, that, that um, protesters are using, for example, where they're located. So there's a lot of limits there. And so in our um, excitement as, as students, as, as people who are speaking back, in our excitement to use those platforms, we need to be thinking about what about owning these platforms? Are we going to create spaces for ourselves? Because it's not good enough that we simply say, well, we've got enough of us who are on that space. We also need to start thinking about ownership. Um, and uh, there's even a suggestion that we need to have black-owned service, for example, because that information, that data that, that is sitting there is somewhere in a Google, uh, in a Googleplex, wherever in the world, and that can be used, I like conspiracy theories, um, that can be used by the CIA and all kinds of things. So I think those are the kinds of things that we need to start thinking about when we think about social media, how it enables us as opposed to simply thinking that that's the panacea for the work that we need to do. who um, has promised to provoke, uh, so we count on him for doing that. <laughs> um, if I want to sort of excite an African optimist, I'll start by saying there are more people in Africa um, using the internet than there are people using the internet in America, and that's a fact. But if I want to appeal to the pessimists from Africa, I'd say, yes, that's true, but there are still some 700, 800 million people in Africa who don't have um, access to the internet. But even though there's been a lot of attention to the numbers, I think what is more important is what these numbers are doing. And we need to pay attention to that. It's not about the activity, it's about the result. So I'll be speaking to some of the results without losing um, sense of the fact that 25 of the least connected countries in the world are from Africa. I mean, one out of 100 people only one out of 100 people are connected in Eritrea. Um, Burundi and the like still have a very um, sh shortage in terms of internet connectivity. Um, that's why most of the conversation you get to hear on social media in Africa always goes back to Kenya, uh, Nigeria, um, Egypt, Tunisia. 
um, South Africa. But when you make these comparisons, it's important to decide whether you want to speak for Africa, e.g., um, somebody says the political conversation in Africa, in, on African Twitter, is higher than US and UK. And that's actually a fact, right? But it's also a fact that there are about 54 countries in Africa. So when you, when you, it depends on what you want to say. But there's a way to look at each issue and appreciate each issue the way it should be appreciated. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pay attention to some of the hashtags um, across different countries. Like I mentioned, unfortunately, it still goes back to the same countries. Um, there's been two mentions of someone tells CNN. We cannot appreciate certain things until we appreciate where we used to be. So if you want to have a sense of what today is, you need to ask a question about where yesterday was. How could a group of Africans have dead CNN in 95, in the year 2000? How, where? But it happened later on, right? Those Kenyans did not need everybody in Kenya to do it. In fact, even though some Kenyans did not do it, some Nigerians, some Eritreans, Ethiopians, Africans in the diaspora were involved, and then CNN, of course, apologized. Um, there was a reason why President Museveni in Uganda shut down the internet. It is because he appreciates the power and essence and what the internet could do, even though he knows that Uganda is one of the least connected countries on the continent. Um, there's been a reference to the fist must fall in South Africa. I don't need to really go, go there. I was involved in Sunu 2012, even though I'd never been in, um, in um, Senegal, Wadi Digage, I was very involved in the application, even though at that time I'd never been, and it was effective in this. So effectiveness is not as much about how many people were using it. It's about whether you got results. And do not forget, some of these hashtags that people think are just strictly about hashtagging actually have representation offline. I'll come to say Bagega um, that we, we ran in 2013. There is Angola 15 plus two, now, I'm going to like, talk about gender and inequality bill that was um, shut down recently by the Nigerian Senate. Because of social media and wanting to look trendy and wanting to look like we are also connected and interested, the Nigerian Senate now has a Twitter handle, NGR Senate. So it means that the Senate, <laughs> it means that the Senate that used to be a very dark place, opaque, you could hardly see what was going on. Everything that happens now, we see on the, we see, not on the floor of the Senate, we see right there on social media. So even though Nigerians did not even know, the bulk of Nigerians on the internet did not even know that there was a bill on gender and equal opportunity bill, they found out how. The Senate shut, it down, shut the bill down on second reading because the handle of the um, Senate tweeted it. And that was the beginning. Within three hours, there was a lot of noise, anger, um, if you check some of the tweets, you see that I might look gentle and cool, but <laughs> I was very, very harsh. And in three hours, or thereabout, the Senate president tweeted at me to say, yeah, uh, the bill was shut down because there was a little disagreement with respect to culture and this, but we're already talking about bringing it back. And yes, they are talking about bringing it back. But the truth of the matter is, if that conversation did not continue, if there was no anger, by the way, there was no public protest, there was nothing physically offline. But the number of people that were involved, even though yes, we have 170 million Nigerians and Nigeria has internet penetration is about 49%. We got the job done, how? We helped the Senate, we forced the Senate to revert itself on the gender and equal opportunity bill. They killed it, now they have to resurrect it. It's coming back, the conversation is on. And I think we have to appreciate that. And it speaks to numbers versus effectiveness. Um, Really and truly, most times, we don't need everybody to be involved in something to get our results. We just need the right people, those who are interested, those who understand it, and, and those who know the essence of what, what is being done. In 2013, we had Save Bagega, Save Bagega, which was basically the, um, this lead, lead poisoned area in, in um, Zamfara State in Nigeria called Bagega. It was lead poisoned due to artisanal mining, and some 1,500 children were at the risk of dying. The president, the then president, Good Luck Jonathan, had actually um, at least stated that money should be released for the remediation. Remediation is technical term for cleaning up the area in 2013. But nine months after, nothing had happened. And people were at the risk of dying, including some 1,500 children. 
Then um, I got an email from um, Follow the Money, an organization involved with tracking the movement of government money and <laughs> where it is stuck and who is holding it. And they basically said, look, um, this is the issue. They, I didn't know about it until then. Um, this is the issue. This is what we're trying to do. If you can help us help push this hashtag on social media, on Twitter. And we went on social media. But meanwhile, we didn't just go ahead to tweet and give the facts and the numbers. Um, I did a blog, posted it on ninjatins.com. Besides that, we also got the phone numbers of certain um, lawmakers that we, we thought would be interested in shining by being seen as one of those people that got this thing to happen. Um, the current Senate president happened to be just um, a first time senator at the time. We got to speak with him. So even though we were tweeting, we were also speaking to these National Assembly members. The money that was not released in nine months came out in three days, and within a week or two, Bagega was cleaned up, and it was done, and it was successful. Thank you. About a, about a week ago, we raised about 30,000 pounds on social media, <laughs> real hard cash, but raised on soft um, virtual internet um, for support Dolapo. I, I can't go really into that. Social media has helped to deregulate activism on, on, for me on the continent, because in the past, especially in Nigeria, what we used to have were superstars, um, activists. But now anybody who is interested in an issue can get everybody uh, speaking about it. So how do we look at this glass? Is, is this glass half empty or, or half full? Depends on how you're looking at it. If the glass used to be full, and now it, of course it's half empty if it used to be full. But if the glass was empty, you have to appreciate it as being what? As being half full. Uh, the other side to look at it is your intention. If your intention is to deplete the glass, then of course it will be that the glass is half full. But if your intention is to fill the glass, then you have to appreciate the fact that the glass is what? So I think it depends on what you're looking at. It depends on <laughs> what you want to do. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all our panelists for their uh, great contribution so far. So now the idea is that we, uh, we allow all the panelists for a brief response to each other, uh, any points that you may want to pick up on. I mean, issues that maybe you might also want to consider is how the state has responded to this. Some of you have mentioned uh, Uganda, uh, social media switch off and so on, but do you have other examples of how the state may have responded to these so-called social media revolutions? And other questions is are, you know, how do social, how does the African social media sphere function in a global context? So we've talked about someone tell CNN, but how else uh, might we think about other global connections um, between, um, but feel free to respond as you see fit. Um, Sorry. Oh, okay, so to pick up on global connections, I think one of the great things that social media has done in Africa is to bring diaspora to be mm, a lot more part of the conversation on what is going on. So um, in a chat with my co-panelists just before we came here, we talked about um, Nigeria Decides being one of the biggest, being the biggest hashtag, Jacket, yeah, was yeah, it? Yeah, last year. Yeah, the biggest um, hashtag last year. And Nigeria Decides is when we were deciding on who our next president would be. And it was so interesting how I was able to follow this all the way from my little bedroom in Coventry and how I was able to be part of the conversation and how I was able to have a favorite candidate and how I was just able to interact with other Nigerians, even people I haven't met, um, just because social media has allowed this participatory um, indulgence of talking to one another, deciding on issues, debating on issues. I mean, but there, there are issues with that. There are issues with that regarding um, tolerance, for instance, many people not being tolerant of your views and maybe them being stronger influencers on social media, which means that your voice can easily get drowned out or you get cyber bullied um, into shutting up. Um, so in, a in terms of global connection, it is great that we no longer have to depend on CNN and BBC to give us hard news on what is going on, what's the reality of what is on ground, but we can actually um, observe issues from our own um, indigenous lenses through other people's Instagram posts and Twitter feeds. Great, thank you. Um, I think on that topic, I would probably use the, the Facebook uh, page that I was talking about, um, Things African Parents. So that's kind of interesting because it means that even people from different African countries, can, you can all kind of relate to that. Um, and it, and you, diaspora and 
Africans who've never been back home can also relate to that. And it's a nice way, I think, for them to connect with those who, you know, anyone who's African who's got an African parent can probably, it, the, the videos are funny to anyone who's got an African parent. So um, I, I would say, again, that's an example of entertainment helping to sort of be more than just entertainment. Thank you so much. Um, <coughs> so again, just following the thread of, of, of social media mapping our existing inequalities and also amplifying some of our basest instincts. I'm talking about trolling and abuse online. Um, I, was, I was told that you call it Voltrons in, in, in Nigeria, yeah, yeah. Um, and sort of the, 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 or in America you can think of it, the Bernie Bros who go and, and attack people. And there's particular groups of people that are more susceptible to, to, to abuse online. Um, in South Africa, we, we call it, we, you know, we have different enclaves, so there's black Twitter, there's, we call it News24 Twitter. Um, News24 Twitter is, is usually very racist Twitter, so it's, it's named after the comments section on articles in, in, um, on the website News24. Um, and there was that article on The Guardian about who are the people that get the most abuse on their sites, and it was majority women, and, and it was black people, um, and you get to see the kinds of abuse that are there. I've been the subject of that, and it really is quite scary at times when, and, and usually, for example, when it comes to women, the differences in the kind of threats that women will get is, you know, the man will say to him, well, you know, you really need to change your mind, I disagree with you, um, if you, that kind of thing, and with women, it will say, well, yeah, I really disagree with you, if you, and I'm gonna rape you, that kind of, of level of abuse. Um, I've seen that my, myself, also I've gotten lots of pictures of monkeys and that kind of thing that we also get. Um, and you know, it, it really is the sort of thing that, it amplifies something that was already there. Um, and also, once again, about ownership of the platforms, what kind of recourse do I have when I report that to Facebook, when I report that um, to Twitter to say, look, I'm getting abuse from, from these types of people. In South Africa, what you find is, a lot of websites have just shut down the comment sections completely um, because it's, it really just got out of hand and it really took away from the, the content um, and that represented, uh, yeah, once again, it represents a, a reality of, of, of our, our country but it also amplifies something where people before, for example, might have had to stick their name to it. Now they can sort of put, you know, maybe, for example, you want to be racist, you put a picture of, of a black person, pretend your name is Jabu when it really isn't, you know, those kind of things that people do um, when, when they're anonymous is quite interesting. And, and the other aspect of this, this, this visibility is also seeing our access to, um, to brands and institutions that are not used to having the specter back on them and how we see that uh, there are many misfires sometimes when brands uh, take on a hashtag and then Twitter sort of reappropriates that and says, mm, no, this is not how you're going to use um, that hashtag. We have a minister in South Africa who's very, um, loves social media and he's actually quite good, I think, at social media. Our sports minister is really good at it. But there's also other times when, for example, our Department of Women is terrible. We call it the Department of Women and Patriarchal Tweets because it sometimes, <laughs> The, the things that come out of it um, are absolutely terrible and, the ki and they've gotten repeatedly in trouble for the kinds of things that they're doing and they haven't learned the art of apology in the age of social media so you continue to justify yourself and not say sorry and that kind of thing. So sometimes when institutions get involved, they just hire an intern and think it's fine, um, but they don't then actually put the hard work to ensure that they can actually engage with people on an intelligent level um, on social media, and it really does, has damaged a lot of brands in the country. Including H&M, I think there was a debate as well. Yeah, yeah a lot. <laughs> uh, personally, I'm interested in looking at, a, um, I appreciate big pictures, but I'm also obsessed with looking at things as individual units. As much as we talk about those that are connected and what's happening, we need to pay attention to what, what is not happening and what could happen. We need to remember those that are not connected. I'd also like to focus on the fact that for, for about 50, 60 years now, Africa has been, African leaders have been talking about Pan-Africanism, um, bringing down the borders and all that. And over half a century after that, we still need about 33 to 35 visas. I need about 33 to 35 visas to travel across um, all the African countries, right? But today, this space has enabled me, it, it enables an average African who, who is connected to travel through all the countries. Um, 
without being to Angola, personally being involved with Angola, for me that's Pan-Africanism. It is organic, nobody can stop it. The president of Angola, as much as I don't like him, <laughs> as much as he might not like me, he cannot stop me from having that conversation on the oppression of um, young people in Angola. That for me is Pan-Africanism and that's what social media has brought to the table. There was this group in, in Senegal, an evolving um, group of young African called Africtivist, basically um, Africans using social media to ask for better governance. And what I realized was that the first time we met in Senegal, um, in Dakar, I think October or November last year, even though I was meeting most of them for the first time, it was as though we had met before because we could have conversations on Sunu 2012, we could have conversations on Feast Must Fall, we could have conversations on Bring Back Our Girls, and on my personal um, hashtag, Eric Wears My iPad, uh, in, 2000, <laughs> in 2004, uh, 12, which I don't want to talk about. <laughs> it, it helped us, it help, helped us to appreciate one another as a people. Um, I like what Tommy said about the diaspora. Um, I'm very interested in diaspora, and most of that interest comes from being able to see that the strength of our conversation online is also that the African diaspora is very, very interested the African internet does not sleep, mostly because our diaspora is awake when we are sleeping. So when you're thinking, don't, don't mind them, this hashtag is going to die by the time they go to bed. The diaspora is going to be waking up at about that time that we are going to bed. <laughs> one other thing that, that has excited me over the past one or two weeks is what some young Africans have been doing with um, Internet for All. Um, I'm personally committed to that. Um, over the next one or two weeks, we're going to connect some young Nigerian girls to the internet for the first time ever. And we intend to capture the emotion and all the effects that comes with that. You should pay attention to the hashtag, internet for all. So ultimately, while we are, uh, whilst we are appreciating or saying what we have is not enough, for me it's really important to appreciate where we're coming from. Let's go back to Nigeria. Uh, in 99, 2000, only about 400,000 people were connected. 400,000 people in, in a population of about 90 million at the time. Uh, the total investment in the sector was about $50 million. 2016, we're talking about, about 100 million people. We're talking about a total investment of about $36 billion. That looks small when you look at it by itself, especially when you start comparing with some other countries, but it's massive when you look at it from the point of it was almost zero uh, less than 20 years ago. So ultimately, Whilst we appreciate and can have conversations on what those that are connected are doing, uh, we must not forget that in looking at the old picture, where we used to be uh, and where we are now, which is the focus of the conversation, we must pay attention to where we should be and where we intend to be. And so we, be, we have to begin to have that conversation about affordability, um, access to the internet, um, um, affordability of the internet, and um, the dependability and the speed and all of those things. And also very critical, the connection of um, girls and women to the internet. We can have a whole new conversation on why, why that is necessary, but I think that's why we have Google to go ahead and check by ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm sure uh, many of you have already started engaging with us on Twitter, and we may not have seen some of that, but we now would like to invite you uh, to uh, you know, engage with us in, in real life or in physical space. Um, so we'd like to invite questions and I suggest we take a few. Uh, please keep them as short as possible so that we can take as many as possible. And um, uh, also it would be nice if you could tell us your name and who you are. Um, so we, okay, there's a lady just there, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, can you hear me? Yes. I'm Debbie, I am a master's student here at LSC. I just want to ask a question, this has been bothering me for a while now, in terms of our use of, um, of social media, in terms of the ethics involved. So we're using social media to make so much noise, we're using it to make changes happen uh, in, you know, in society, but where, where, where does the boundary lie in terms of what we can do and what we cannot do, and who, who actually sets the boundaries so that you know you can you can abuse people online you can throw people you can post a negative messages about people who actually decides where the ethics lie i, I would like to hear everybody's viewpoint yeah. on that thank you uh, for your question and there's a question here at the front yeah 
the mic is coming. Hello, uh, I'm Benjamin, and I'm from the University of Law. Um, my question is for Monica. Um, how do you think, uh, I know you mentioned that BuzzFeed and other entertainment websites don't need to necessarily project serious issues, but don't you think that it is possible for entertainment websites and entertainers themselves to actually address political issues, because in that way they actually reach more masses than politicians themselves? An example is uh, a comedian from South Africa. He's now the host of a daily show, Trevor Noah. He's very funny, but he has brought politics to the conversation through his humor. And in that way, people begin to talk about serious issues. Like, like for example, the corruption in South Africa by Jacob Zuma, that people wouldn't talk about in formal conversations, but, but more informal ones. So how can you help, or how can you enable entertainers and entertainment websites to address serious issues without being necessarily too political? Great, uh, so a question there, and a blue push cardigan. Thank you for your comments. Uh, my name is Latifa Durasuniati, and I, my, question, my question is mainly for Tony and Justin. Um, social media has done so many great things in Nigeria, but I have also found that people use it to spread dangerous narratives online, particularly ethnic intolerance. And I just wanted to get your comments or, uh, on how that has affected um, kind of the usage and agency um, through the, for instance, the, uh, the last year during the elections, um, people were talking about Buhari wanting to Islamicize Nigeria, or we have um, Namdi Kanu and Radio Biafra. <coughs> um, so I just wanted to get your comments on what that means for social media usage and activism in Nigeria. Yeah, thank you. And there was a question just a few rows behind that. Blue. Hi, my, my name is Lauren. I run a, a consultancy firm that does government relations and strategic comms. Um, and mine was more of an observation on um, Panache's point about uh, Twitter activism and sort of surprise at election results. Because this is obviously something that we had hugely in the United Kingdom last year. Uh, the ONS, uh, the Office of National Statistics uh, in the UK estimated in August last year that on a daily basis, 78% of adults in the United Kingdom are online. And yet, Twitter predicted a completely different election result to the actual election result. So I think um, the issue of social media <laughs> and Twitterism versus uh, complete engagement offline is still something which is globally a very interesting and very developing mm -hmm. uh, narrative. Mm -hmm. There's a question there. Yeah. Uh, greetings, my name is Tuchaba from Johannesburg, but I study at the University of Cape Town and chairperson of the African Union chapter. Um, I'm more directed to you, Panache, um, in terms of all the activities that have been happening in South Africa, in terms of hashtag fees must fall, hashtag rose must fall, which have been criticized as very elitist uh, because they l literally look at the issues that are um, faced by students in universities or in elite spaces, and that they have uh, no concern for the issues that are faced by the marginalized majority who don't have access to social media, that once the students who are at the university have overcome a specific hashtag, they move on to the next one. Whereas the people in the communities that are experiencing um, lack of um, access to education or um, are currently facing in terms of gender violence and uh, discrimination don't get enough coverage. Whereas if UCT posts hashtag this must fall, everyone is buzzing about it in the country. But if something happens in Kailicha, where my grandmother lives, who has absolutely no access to social media, will not be actually assisted from that. So how is the media going to ensure that they are going to go to the marginalized communities where they need um, the kind of exposure that is necessary for us to create the solutions. How is the social media, or how is media currently working on achieving those goals? Thank you. Okay, and then let's do one final question here. Quick question, we're running out of time, unfortunately. <laughs> but please do feel free to post your questions on Twitter. Um, I'm sure some of our respondents will be able to respond via Twitter. Um, hi, my name is Debbie. I have a question about content creation. So especially for those of you who work as journalists or bloggers who having to deal with both a local audience but also an international one, I'm wondering what are the differences between, for instance, what your international audience or stakeholders want to hear about Africa 
what are the stories that the people around you that you're working with want to hear about themselves? And like, when you're writing a story, how do you navigate those two different tastes and expectations? Are there some stories that you think are necessary but the world doesn't care to hear? Are there some stories that you're being forced to, t to tell but don't necessarily apply to the situation you're in? And just how do you deal with that in general? Thanks. Great question. So we have a range of questions, and uh, I think you should feel free to answer the, the ones, to pick the ones that you really want to answer. Some were addressed to individual pa panel members, some were addressed to the whole panel around social media ethics, freedom of speech on the web. I think there were also some overlaps in some of the questions, so we'd like to start. Okay, yeah, talking about overlaps, um, I will take the first question, um, which is about free speech and where the boundaries lie um, <coughs> in relation to the spread of ethnic intolerance and um, rumors and the really horrible uses of social media in the same space where this activism for social change is going on. Um, where should we say the boundaries lie? This brings us to the discourse, um, the discourse around censorship and who should be the censor. Should it be the media organizations, the tech media organizations themselves? Should Twitter be the one censoring what we post? Should it be Facebook? Should it be Google? Should it be the government? Or should it be us, the users? Um, this is one question that has plagued everyone. And as much as I would not want the government to censor me, there still needs to be some form of um, ethics around how we can self-censor ourselves. So um, the, what I subscribe to in this situation is that my freedom stops where it, when it, where it encroaches on the freedom of the next person. So for instance, if I am speaking against um, a particular political candidate because I am very convinced that he is not the next person to rule me, and my neighbor on Twitter is for that candidate, the moment I begin to bully that person into shutting up, the moment I begin to not want to be open to what their ideas are and why they're subscribing to that individual, the moment I start to block and I start to report and I start to send threats. I think some people go as far as getting you know, fiscal threats. In, I'm coming to your house and I'll beat you up if you don't keep quiet. Um, the moment that starts to happen, I think that is where the freedom ends, the freedom of speech should end. About ethnic intolerance rumors, I like what Panach said about this being amplifications of what already exists. So even where we try to restrict these things on the internet, I think it would be more sustainable, that's becoming my buzzword for this summit, but I think it would be more sustainable to address those issues, even from one person to the other in your living rooms. Like, are you really as tolerant of other ethnicities as you would like to believe? Because it is these convictions that flow into your tweets, that flow into your Facebook posts. And so it's a, it, it's a question that we will keep asking till tomorrow. We probably wouldn't get it right, but we can always try. Thank you, Monica. There were questions uh, on content creation for you and audiences, I think, and the political uses of... Um yeah, um, oh, yep, I'll take the, the one you asked me about um, how to make serious news entertaining as well, or more accessible because it's in the way you present it. Trevor Noah is actually a really good example, first of all, because I love him, but also he does a really good job of that. And actually, I used him recently for a story I did, which um, was about Africans who actually support Donald Trump, and they exist, these people. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, Trevor Noah did a sketch on it. I don't know if you saw it. Um, and he sort of was comparing them to, he was comparing Trump to Gaddafi. And it, it was great, it was brilliant. So I used him in, in the story, but it also, you know, it was an, it was an interesting way into a, a more deeper, more scary, and more important story, which is that Trump's, the reason Trump appeals, um, you know, he appeals to basically the same people in Africa for the same reasons, that they're scared, that they feel they don't have a voice. Um, and, and, it, and, and that's an important thing, because it showed that African, the African electorate also face a lot of the same problems as the US do. So it was a way to, it was a serious story, but it was quite funny to sort of look at it through. Imagine if, um, you know, Trump is a sort of a white Gaddafi or a white Mobutu or something. So it's hard to do it, and it's a difficult line to walk. Um, and we do try and do that, BuzzFeed, and, and it's possible. It is possible. But yeah, I'll, I'll think of that when I'm, I'm doing my next stories. Um, what was the other one? Uh, audiences. Oh. 
international versus local. Um, yeah, this is, this is really tough as a journalist because we often get criticized um, for misunderstanding Africa. And I have to say, the colleagues that I live with in Nigeria, if you live in Nigeria, you, it's, there is a problem with parachute journalists who just come in for a few days and go. But most of us live there, work there, and they're really excellent journalists. But the fact is, it's, you do have to choose your audience. And we can't, you can't, even in the UK, you can't write for everybody. Um, you don't want your audience to feel like they're being misrepresented or misunderstood. But the fact is, if you dropped a Nigerian man, say, in Slough, what he's going to see, what he's going to find interesting for Nigerians back home is not going to be the same as people who already live in Slough, who are reading, I don't know, The Sun or whatever. It's so you have to think really hard about it. But ultimately, even if you're writing for a different audience, you do want people that you're writing about to recognize, OK, this isn't how I would have approached it, or, but it is true what you're saying. And we're very, it's very easy to say, oh, you journalists don't know what you're talking about, or you're just, you know, we have to use shorthand. We can't cover every aspect. And, and, and a good example, actually, journalists use often Nigeria divided into a mostly Muslim North and a predominantly Christian South. We all hate using that phrase, but you cannot every single article you write, unless it's specifically about religion, you can't go into it, but it's also mixed. With, I mean, you can tease it out a bit, but that kind of thing really does annoy people. And you try your best. You basically do try your best to. But um, there are some stories that cross over better than others as well. I just wanted yeah. to, very quickly on the ethics and uh, censorship and, and um, truth kind of thing. There was a really um, nice, well, a really interesting recent example of a, a Nigerian Twitter user called Sugar Belly. And she had been, um, she had been raped uh, some years back and she sort of kept quite quiet about it. And it was by uh, members of a political family who were quite well known. And when she came out with this, it just provoked this horrible uh, storm of misogyny and awful behavior. But it also did get, and she stuck to her ground, and you're not going to get nuanced debates on Twitter, I don't think, personally. Um, but what it did do was it showed, because it showed such an ugly uh, attitude towards women and towards victims of sexual violence in Nigeria, that even that people who wouldn't necessarily have been aware that this is something that women do face, it would have opened them to that. I mean, they may or may not have changed their mind, but they would have learned something. So along with the horrible, ugly stuff, it, sometimes it's actually good to expose that this stuff exists so people see it's, it's real. Thank you, Monica. Panash, I think there was a question on elitist opinion leaders uh, on yeah. Twitter. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's the point I was raising, Chaba, about the fact of where um, attention will, will go to. So it depends on who is tweeting and what they're tweeting about. So again, and speaking about it's reflecting our realities. For example, um, the campus action that we're seeing is not anything new since at least the first time there was a big um, campus um, uprising was probably in the late 90s in South Africa. But that happened, um, I think it was at UKZN, which is University of KwaZulu Natal, which is a historically black institution. Well, it's actually historically white, but it's not in the, the same sort of tier as your University of Cape Town, the University of Edward and University of Pretoria. Um, and so that, you know, we know year in, year out, um, campuses are burnt. Um, there's all kinds of stoppages to, to um, to the, the school year that happens because of fees and that kind of thing, but it's only once it happened on the campuses of historically white institutions, and when those campuses now had the threat of, of their property being destroyed, that then the media paid attention. So again, some of these things, it's something that students talked about a lot, and being aware of how do they, um, then those who are privileged by that, that proximity to, 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 to whiteness, if that's the language that we use, how do we then use that privilege to then put a spotlight? And it, and it then also meant that we had a lot more responsibility to bring a lot more um, issues to the fore. And I do also think that, so you were also directing a lot of questions to me as a media. I'm, I'm not the media, I'm not capital the media, right? Uh, I'm someone who works in that space. Um, and the reason why I did that, why I work in that space is because I'm speaking back to, to some of those, those, those narratives, but that's still very limited. Um, and the ways in which that, that changed, we've been very aware of that and being, for example, 
I think a lot of people focused on when the students went to the union buildings. Um, and there was a huge uh, fight between students about the fact that from students from historically black institutions were saying, you know, we've been protesting about this for years and we've never been invited to the union buildings. It's only when you guys decide to protest about this. You get buses to get to have you sent there, but we don't get the same kind of treatment. So it's something that students are very aware of, um, but media changes some of these narratives as well. For example, students are talking about outsourcing on campuses, right? They're talking about the fact that um, you know, workers, the ground staff on the campus are not being treated while they're being unfairly dismissed, they don't get the minimum wage and that kind of thing. So there definitely is a lot of that awareness of how do we then move this conversation um, beyond simply how the media likes to frame it as this is an issue about statutes, when it's not. A lot of pe young people are talking about this is actually a fund fundamental question about the rainbow nation. It's a fundamental question about how South Africa is run. It's a question about capitalism. It's a question about the curriculum, all kinds of things, but usually what happens in the media, even now when it's reported about Rosemus for Oxford, they like to make it uh, seem as if these kids are upset about a statue, when it's not. It's about a wider issue um, that's there. And that sort of goes to the question of ethics, um, on the, or rather who, who, who polices it. For me, ultimately, it comes down to who owns the company. Um, and as much as we can speak back to it, who owns the company? Again, looking at Facebook, for example, Mark Zuckerberg even had to post something to his employees to say, please, please stop putting down, was it pictures of uh, Black Lives Matter? I can't remember what exactly. Um, it was. But that kind of thing speaks to the disconnect between those who are driving the traffic versus those who are actually manning um, the, 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 the stations at, at Facebook. So those are the things I think we, we need to, to, to look to. And my last point I just want to say, as much as I've been speaking about limits, limits, limits of, of social media, um, I can say one way in which social media has really enabled something great. We speak about pan-Africanism, it's also speaking about the idea of global blackness, for example, and the transatlantic, um, the transatlantic communication um, lines. So, for example, a lot of students have have gained a lot from what's been happening in the U.S. Uh, from Black Lives Matter were very much politicized by that. And likewise, Black Lives Matter students who've been talking about, for example, the fact that um, the Harvard Law School's seal is from a slave, uh, former slave masters. Um, um, a family seal, those kind of things have also been informed by the things that are happening in South Africa. So it has helped to, it to, to have a lot of conversations. I know even things like a lot of the, the rise of black feminism, intersectionality, a large part of that um, on the campuses in South Africa has to do with Twitter because there's a lot of exchange between black American, um, African American um, feminists in, Amer in the States and black feminists in South Africa. All of those exchanges have really helped us um, and, and spread a lot of things that are usually very academic, but now we're starting to, to, to apply it in ways that, that apply to us. Great, and the last word is for Jeff. Um, talking about boundaries online, the, other, the converse of that question is where are boundaries in society? Because whatever happens online sort of has a representation or a variation um, offline. And the laws that govern each country or each society still affects laws, it, it affects um, behavior online and offline. And then these different tools have also found a way to help you as an individual manage your, your space online. You can block people. Okay, I don't block people for business reasons. <laughs> the reason I don't block people is because um, part of calculation, calculating my influence is that those people I affect, and by the time I'm talking to a brand, we need to have those numbers imputed into my, my reach. One million people per day, blah, blah, blah. What I do is mute. So there's always an option. So you are muted, you think you're abusing or trolling, I don't even see you, apart from the first one. <laughs> apart from the first one. There's always something to be done. Um, I'm a believer in spontaneous disorder. I think that a space can govern itself without having uh, an idiami run it, or uh, a Buhari or whoever. I, I think the space can govern itself. Coming to um, Latifa's question on Nigeria and um, dangerous narratives and um, ethnic intolerance, it again comes down to spontaneous disorder. Buhari would be the last person to complain about social media, for instance. The reason is because, first of all, his inaugural speech, he referenced social media twice. The first one was him saying, thank you. The, first one, the second one was him understanding what social media did to President Jonathan, and immediately saying, you know, let's find a way to manage the way we run 
this, um, this space. Social media actually helped to change the narrative for President Buhari. Um, what did they do? There was a picture of him released, doing, having a hi-fi with, with a very young person. There were pictures of him looking presidential um, in a suit. There were pictures of him dressing as an Igbo. Buhari is from the north of Nigeria. You know the whole ethnic thing that comes with election. So he, he was dressed up as an Igbo person. And he looks really like an Igbo chief. And there was a picture of him dressed up as a Yoruba person. And all of this actually really and truly helped to reshape the conversation that had been set for him um, as, as an Islamic fundamentalist. So where you have people saying, I hate you, you are Yoruba, I hate you, you are Hausa, uh, there is also a conversation in the sense that there are people that are actually helping to let people see what they could not see or what they are not able to see because of either limited travel. One of those is one of my friends on social media, Amazonic, who is a Christian from Bonu State, Nigeria. Now, ordinarily, an average Nigerian actually thinks that Bonu State, definitely everybody is a Muslim. Until he said it that day that there are actually a lot of Christians in Bonu and indeed in the north of Nigeria. A lot of people did not know. And from the reactions that, people, that I was seeing from that conversation, he was educating a lot of people. So even though we have all of these negative side of social media, we really must also appreciate the positive side. And we should not be too afraid of what is not coming, or sorry, of, of what we can't see or what is coming. Yes, innovation often travels with problems, but are we going to say that because every innovation comes with a new problem that we should stop innovating? No, for every problem that arises, there really and truly will always be a solution and ways to deal with them. Um, I think that's where I'll stop, thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid we have run out of time, so I, have, will, I will have to draw an end uh, to this, this panel. Um, but I've really enjoyed it, and I hope you've enjoyed it as much uh, as I did. And the good news is, of course, that we can continue the conversation on Twitter, so I would like to encourage you to do that and to ask our panelists for more questions. Um, so please allow me to thank our panelists.